So let's take a look at a case study of Bermuda grass at a central Ohio high school. Now this is the very first time that I ever visited Pickerington Central High School. This is Tiger Stadium there. And what I came across here in this first visit was a field that was about ready to be shut down. Now, at this point, they were moving games to alternate sites, and essentially they had played their last game already, uh, not even halfway through the season, at the stadium. So the questions were asked of, what did we need for them in the field? How often was it being used and by what sports? And what we found was that the field was actually being used almost twice as much as it had been uh, three years prior. And so the, the question became, well, do we build a field that can accommodate the 75 to 80 events that we're now having on the field, or do we roll back that schedule to the original 30 or 40 events that we might have had in years prior? Well, that was a very simple question for the school district to answer. They had to be able to use the field as much as possible. And so the first thing that we established was that we needed a field that could drain water much better than the native soil that they had there currently. And so we devised a system called the Buckeye Sand Cap. And what this was, we'll look at here in terms of the sand slit drainage that we used. So the sand slit drainage system uh, basically puts a trench in the ground that is one inch wide. It's about six or seven inches deep, and these are spaced out 10 inches on center apart. So what this allows uh, us to do is it creates a void that water can percolate down into the subsoil now. And then over top of that, we put in two inches of sand. This served as our base for the grassing system that we were going to put on here. Now we had two different options that we looked at. The first being Kentucky bluegrass and the other option being Bermuda grass. Now, given the fact that the school absolutely could not lose this field for the spring sports season in 2019, it was absolutely imperative that we only do the work in summertime. That made bluegrass an unlikely choice in trying to get it grown in from sod and most definitely from seed to be able to play on it by mid-August. So, between that aspect of using the summertime to be able to grow in Bermuda grass and also the fact that it was the more durable option between the two, Bermuda grass was selected by the school district. So, with that, we move forward to June 10th, 2019. Sprigging was completed under the lights. Now we move forward to June 10th, sprigging under the lights. This process takes roughly three to four hours to complete. It's a very simple process where uh, sod is ground up into small pieces, and then those pieces are then pushed on the ground as basically little plant starts uh, for the grass to begin to grow together. Now we move ahead. Now this is seven days after we sprigged. Doesn't look like much is happening. And what you can't see in this photo is how wet we are trying to keep this surface. So it's to the point where it's almost ponding and we're continually watering it, trying to keep these little plant parts that you see here all scattered throughout the field, these sprigs, keeping them wet so that as they start to push roots down into the soil and push new green tissue and leaf blades out into the uh, field itself, that they have plenty of water. So it's about a three or four week process where just not a whole lot seems like it's happening. And it can be very discouraging to look at. There's no question about that. So as we fast forward here, this is day seven. Now we fast forward to day 28. And wow, what a difference. We've got over 30 or 40% grass coverage at this point, And we are really pushing some growth. So now we fast forward again from the early part of July to the beginning of August. And now you can see it's beginning to look like a sports field. Right? We've got our mowing practices in place. We're doing all the right things to be ready for the game. It was not long after this photo was taken in early August of 2019 that we had both uh, girls and boys soccer teams along with a football team out for uh, a short and small practice there to get them acclimated to the surface. 
with really, really positive reviews from all coaches and players. So now here we are. This is August 30th, 2019, the first home soccer match. Field right now is being mowed at uh, just under an inch and a half. Very good playability for soccer. Fast forward here to September 13th, 2019, the very first football game that's played. So at this point, they've played nine soccer matches on this field and then flipped around and painted it and got it ready for the first home football game. So at this point, we now fast forward to October 11th. So what we don't see in between here is that we did, at this point, uh, right after the first home football game, overseed the field with perennial ryegrass. And what that does is a couple of things. One, it gives us really nice green color as the Bermuda grass begins to go dormant here in October and especially into November as temperatures decline and day lengths get shorter and that sort of thing. So it gives us that nice green color and it also grows a little bit taller. We raise our mowing height up just a little bit to about an inch and a half and it gives us a nice wearable surface so that we've got something on top and protecting the Bermuda grass below just a little bit. So again, this is October 11th. This would be the sixth football game on the field. And at this point, they had played uh, about 16 home soccer matches. Final game of the regular season, end of October, right around Halloween. You can see here, the grass looks a little bit uh, darker shade from what we saw before. And what you're seeing is much more ryegrass that's apparent versus Bermuda grass. The Bermuda grass is under there. It's actually still growing, uh, not... Uh, very much at this point, but it's actually acting as a base for which cleats can go in and out, cuts can still be made. And the one thing that we did notice uh, all season, even in the first season, was that this Tahoma 31 Bermuda grass, it does not divot very much at all. And that's a good thing in the sense that we can get cleats in and cleats out very cleanly without uh, turf coming out from under the foot of the athlete. So very, uh, very, very positive thing that we were intrigued to see uh, during that first season. Now here we are, this is November 8th. Uh, this is the final home playoff game. And so again, fields held up well. There's been a couple hard frosts at this point. You can see a little bit of the Bermuda grass here in the foreground in the end zone that is definitely starting to go dormant now after those frosts, but the field held up well. This is uh, the 32nd game that had been played on this field uh, to date. And then after this practice, or after this game, excuse me, the team went on to have another 15 practices on the field as they made their way to the state championship that season. So what we learned in that first year was we knew that we had a product that could sustain a lot of games. And we knew that it was a marriage between the drainage system underneath with the Buckeye sand cap, along with the Tahoma 31 Bermuda grass that was really making this entire thing work. It wasn't just one or the other of those things. So with that said, our next big challenge was going into winter and what would we find? So here we sat on February 7th, 2020, before any lockdowns or virtual learning sessions, anything like that. This is the field and how it looked. And overall, it looked pretty good. This is all ryegrass that you're seeing, uh, some other weedy uh, grasses that we see out there in terms of poa annua and things that we need to clean up that following spring. So moving ahead into spring, obviously there wasn't a spring sports season, but we did learn a little bit more about uh, how Tahoma was going to break dormancy and most especially uh, what type of, and if any, winter kill that we might have from being exposed to cold temperatures. So we had nine days that were uh, 10 degrees or colder at this site over that winter of 19 into 20. Here we are in May, uh, early May, and seeing the Bermuda grass just starting to break dormancy and our ryegrass is still chugging along pretty good. Same date, different angle. So again, Bermuda grass is just starting to come in uh, and it's doing pretty well. The one thing I do want to point out, and we talked about it a little bit in terms of the issues that we can have from overseeding. 
So if we look at the right hand side of this photo, the green grass, that is 100% Bermuda that was not overseeded at all with perennial ryegrass. On the left hand side, that, wa that was Bermuda grass that was overseeded with perennial ryegrass and then sprayed with a chemical around the 1st of June to kill off the ryegrass and leave just the Bermuda grass behind. So again, the, the thing to consider here is that we've got a choice between uh, not overseeding in the fall and basically having to manage very carefully with uh, color and wear and those sort of things, the expectations for the field owner versus if we uh, do overseed with ryegrass, the fall is fairly straightforward. Uh, but when we get into this uh, May into mid-June time frame, what we call the transition period from overseeded to 100% Bermuda grass turf, it can look a little ugly, and it definitely does. And so uh, the school district was aware of that, and we talked about that uh, over and over again. So they weren't alarmed when they saw our field, which is, uh, this is seven days after spraying out all the ryegrass. So we're seeing uh, Bermuda grass here that, it's just really, really starting to get going, ryegrass that's dying off. And so a few weeks later, after we were fully greened up and really growing uh, close to about July 4th, we had our uh, cultural practices that were completed. And so this included uh, deep tying aeration, uh, a verticutting process that, again, stimulated growth points uh, by basically uh, slicing through the grass and creating say eight growth points out of four growth points. And, you know, splitting those in half and creating a tighter, more dense surface and reducing uh, the organic material that's at the surface that can impede water flow down into the soil and our drainage system and cause other uh, issues with footing and that sort of thing. So the last process too is this deep tie aeration. And again, with trying to preserve the integrity of the downward movement of water and the system that we've built uh, in terms of the sand slits and then the sand cap over top of it, this process makes uh, about three quarters of an inch in diameter, eight or nine inch deep holes that keep that interface between sand and the subsoil open and available for water to move down through. Now here we are, this is uh, seven days after our top dressing and airification event. You can see the grass is growing back up through the sand. Again, just trying to use that sand to smooth out any small imperfections, any low spots, and things of that nature. And here we are two weeks later. We're now mowing down to game height and getting the field ready for what we hope will be fall sports season. A couple things to note here. This is three weeks after our top dressing Field's looking really good. Bermuda is chugging along. One thing I want to point out is this bench area here. Uh, this is the visitor side. And some areas there where we had uh, high traffic and tarps weren't always being used to protect the field, we did have a little bit of winter kill right there. And so it took through uh, about the middle of July, almost the end of July, for those to fill back in. And so uh, just you know, a quick caveat that, yeah, we, we definitely – see issues in high traffic areas, but uh, down the middle of the field where we were concerned about, you know, late season practices and things like that, we saw absolutely no issues um, with winter kill or the grass coming back and being as strong or stronger than it ever had been. There's another photo here. This is the beginning of August. We're now four weeks away from what we hope will be a season, but there's no assurances yet until we fast forward and here we are. This is August 30th, the first home football game of the season. Uh, at this point, there had been uh, four soccer matches on the field and then the field was flipped over and painted out for football. So this is a game that was nationally televised on ESPN between Pickerington Central and their crosstown rival Pickerington North. So again, our, our whole outcome when we first devised this entire plan with the team at the school was to have a field that plays outstanding and be consistent season after season, game after game. And when we conceived this, we said we wanted the field to look even better the second year on day one than it did uh, the first year on day one. And I think everybody agreed that we achieved that, that end game. And so you can see here, overall, um, very, very pristine surface. 
you know, even after hosting those soccer games to get the year started. Very proud of the way that it turned out. Now, looking here at field level, we can see, again, a very, very dense, uniform surface. And as we move forward through the season, this was going to be critical because we began playing uh, upwards of five and six games per week. So a typical schedule out at the field was uh, four soccer games per week and then one or two football games uh, between varsity, uh, reserve, freshman, and uh, middle school or junior high. So again, one more picture here from first game. Uh, mowing height again here is just under an inch and a half. That worked well in 2019, and we didn't deviate from that. So now we fast forward. This is mid-season. Uh, this is end of September, and at this point we've played uh, roughly 18 home soccer matches, and this would have been the sixth football game on the field. So, again, field's holding up very, very well. Um, very little issues with wear and that sort of thing in any of the key areas, whether it be full mouth for soccer or between the hashes for football. One thing that we did because of the heavy play, we did a top dressing uh, mid-season, something we didn't do the year prior. We did it prior to the season, and this actually worked out well. It gave us you know, just a little bit of protection uh, right around the key uh, areas of the plant going into uh, the end of October, uh, middle to end of October, to uh, protect those grass plants from what was already had been a lot of traffic and was seemingly going to be even more as we headed into the end of the regular season and the postseason. So one thing to point out here, this is a good picture of the goal mouth area. This is at the very end of the season. So at this point there had been, uh, I believe, 28 home soccer matches. And overall right here, no loss of, uh, no significant loss of turf and definitely no soil exposed like we might see on a native soil field. So. The surface stability is still there. Uh, what you're seeing is dormant Bermuda with the ryegrass that's been worn away, as we talked about. That gives us that nice wearable surface that we're looking for. So, again, held up tremendously well under a lot of traffic. So here, this is uh, one of the final playoff games. I believe this is the second-to-last home playoff game that we're getting ready for. Here's another view of that same day as they're getting ready to paint. And then this is the final playoff game. This is have been October 30th, 2020. Again, the field has held up tremendously well. At this point, we've played 47 events on the field in just uh, under 74 days. So again, a very, very high uh, volume of games, and especially in such a short time frame. The field's held up remarkably well. And there you have it. So full circle, you know, the things that we learned about uh, the field in year two were, one, we could put even more games on it than, than we had the first year. And two, it was holding up to the expectations of being able to host 40 or to 45 games per season uh, for a total of 80 to 90 games per year that we had originally designed and built it for. So very eager to see uh, in year three as we go through and do some mechanical removal of those weedy grasses that we had talked about, the Poa Annual and the Poa Trivialis, and then uh, try to continue to evolve the field and the maintenance practices that we've built up both internally and with the contract service providers that we have in place out there. So I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about uh, Pickering Central and Tiger Stadium and how they converted their surface to a sand-capped Bermuda 